So, hey, it's so good to have you. Today we have a, it is our honor today to have Pastor Jonathan and Alicia Moore. He's going to be preaching the word this morning all the way from San Antonio, Texas. Come on, somebody. San Antonio, Texas. Now, I, I have known this couple for years. In fact, I used to play bass for them. They're very talented people. And, and I've been trying to twist Pastor Jonathan's arm. If he'll just sing a little bit, we'll be blessed. I like the, we, He don't even have to preach. Just sing. Like, God is good. But he won't do that. So he's like, I'm going to preach. So I want you to welcome. Give him a freedom welcome all the way from North Rock Church, San Antonio, Texas. Pastor Jonathan Moore. Come on. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus one more time. Come on, make some noise for him. Has he been good to you? Yeah. Wow, wow. It is an honor to be at Freedom Church. Finally, I have heard so much about this amazing community of faith and uh, have watched via the World Wide Web and the socials uh, for years all that God is doing here. And, and I've mentioned it both services. i got to tell you guys as well. Uh, you... You guys, Freedom Church has made a significant impact. I know that you know you're making an impact all over the world, uh, but you made an impact on North Rock Church in more ways than one. Um, but one that I want to point out specifically somewhat recently, probably five years ago, we decided we've been doing Freedom Small Groups. How many have been through a Freedom Small Group, been through a Freedom Conference? Come on. Nothing like it. And... We've been doing Freedom Small Groups for years, but we had not been willing to host our own Freedom Conference. And uh, Pastor Wade kind of talked us into it and, and said, listen, we'll send a group down to help facilitate it. And so our first Freedom Small Group was probably uh, Freedom Conference was about five years ago. And uh, Dawn came down with a host of other leaders from here on your dime, no less and helped us make our first Freedom Conference happen. We've been doing them ever since. And so God is changing hearts and setting people free in San Antonio, Texas today because of your investment. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for that. I love your pastor. You have world-class leaders. I know that you know that. But they are world-class leaders. I've known them, been watching them. I've actually known Dawn uh, since she was a little girl. We grew up in the same church in Jackson, Mississippi, and her older brothers were friends of mine. I was very close to one of her brothers, so I've got her by a few years, but I spent a lot of time in that house when she was just a little, little girl with her mother making me cheese toast and things like that. Uh, I love that family. love Pastor Wade as well. Do you love your pastors one more time? Can we make some noise for them? World class. World class. Let's read a scripture before you were seated. I know you're ready to sit down, but let's read, read, read a scripture before you're seated. And I believe that God has a word for some people in the room today. And uh, I want us to open our heart to receive what he has for us. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41 through 45. And to give context, Israel had been in a three and a half year drought. And that drought had brought famine. And all of the things that come along with famine, hopelessness, fear, anxiety. And that's where we pick up our reading. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink. For I hear, everybody say, I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed. Everybody say he climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground. Watch this. And he prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look. Everybody say, look. Look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him, go and look. Finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab. Tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. Soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a 
terrific rainstorm. I want to talk today for just a few minutes on the subject of looking for rain. Looking. Looking for rain. Father, I pray that you would just have your way in this room. I pray that you would open hearts, open minds to receive what you want to say. Anoint me. Use me as a vessel. God, I want to speak your words only. I don't want to speak my words. I want to speak your words today in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody say in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. I know he's not supposed to, but Pastor Wade has bragged on the 11, 11 o'clock service. He really likes this service, so just want y'all to know that. But not on Easter. He wants the Saturday services will be his favorite services on Easter, right? I uh, saw a video, a viral like TikTok. I actually saw it on Instagram. And I don't do the TikTok thing, but I saw it about a year ago. And it was this, whenever it was very, uh, very cool for people to post how it started, how it's going videos, or how it started, how it's going pictures. And uh, y'all remember that trend? I know some people probably still do it, but yeah, it was, it was very popular about a year ago. And a guy posted a picture of his house, the backyard of his house, and he, he had a home that was on a lake. And um, it was a beautiful, like, surreal almost scene of, of this dock that's there and, and the, wa the waves are just kind of lapping coming off the lake and there's a boat there and there's jet skis there and all sorts of water sports, you know, paraphernalia that is there. And that was the how it started. And then he showed a, another video about how it's going and it looked a little bit like this right here, how it's going now. Not so... Not so serene, not so surreal. It was, it was the, the dock was still there, the boat was still there, the water, uh, the, the jets, uh, the jet skis were still there, all the water sports equipment was there, but it was actually just sitting down on a dry lake bed because a multi year drought had sapped all of the water out of Lake Medina, which is actually just outside of San Antonio, and it was about 3%. Full. How I many of you know 3% full is not very full? And, and so that's what it looked like. And as it was interesting to me as I was looking at kind of this shocking video from my part of the state, um, it, it struck me that a lot of people's spiritual lives look like this picture of a drought. Like at one, at one point in, in your life, you were full of joy. You were full of passion for the presence of God. You were full of a passion to serve the kingdom of God. But somewhere along the way, a spiritual drought has kind of taken over your life and you don't have the same passion, the same joy that you used to have. And so I want to I ask you a question today. I know that you're in the building, so it might sound like I'm preaching to the choir, but I know that there are some people in the room that are experiencing a drought somewhere in your life, somewhere in your spirit. I want, I want you to look at your life today and examine, is there any area of me that might be living in drought? Is it a, a marriage drought? It is, is it a compassion drought? Is it a joy drought? drought, where even though you might smile on the outside as you walk in and pass the greeters, you know that deep within you're not smiling. There's a drought of joy in your life. Maybe you're experiencing a contentment drought, and you're looking for something to give you fulfillment, something to give you peace, and yet you just can't seem to tap into peace. A drought deep within. I've begun to lean into the significance over the last few years as I've gotten older. I've begun to lean into the significance of staying hydrated. It's amazing when you're young, you just, you know, you, you run around, you play, you sweat, you get some water, and you go right back to running around sweating. As you get older, it's amazing how your body starts just doing different things, and, and you realize, I need to hydrate more, and and you, you know, dry skin, achy head, you know, weak knees. Your body 
will tell you when it is thirsty. It'll tell you when it's, when it's thirsty. But here's something, here's something else that, I, that, that, that I've learned. Your soul has a way of telling you when it's thirsty as well. Like if you deprive your body of the necessary fluids that it needs, it will tell you. And if you deprive your soul of the necessary fluid that it needs from heaven, your dehydrated heart will send desperate messages. Maybe a wave of worry. And you're like, where is this worry coming from? You're having trouble identifying why you're even feeling anxious. Why, are, why am I feeling anxiety right now? I, I want to submit to you today that all of those things could be a symptom of a dryness deep within. Irritability. Loneliness, you know, flashes of temper driving down the road. One little thing sets you off and you're yelling and saying other things in the car. And you, Where did that even come from? It could be a symptom of a dryness deep within your spirit. Exhaustion, sleeplessness, hopelessness, paranoia. And I know that some people say, no, that's just kind of... It's just kind of who I am, and this is how I'm going to have to live my life. Doesn't everyone have gloomy days? Doesn't everyone have you know, sad Saturdays? And I would say that while those things might be inevitable to a degree, they are not unquenchable. And I've come to preach to you about a God who's able to fill you to overflowing. And the river of life is in this room today. Anything that you have come needing today, you can receive it today. And if you've come with a dryness deep within, God can feel you and quench your dry heart today. In the passage that I read from 1 Kings, Israel had been in a three and a half year drought, famine, hopelessness, fear. But on top of that, man, they, they were led by an evil king named Ahab and his perhaps more infamous evil queen, Jezebel. Many of us have at least heard of Jezebel. And this king and queen were leading the nation of Israel away from God, leading them into idolatry. And in the midst of this challenging season, God raises up a drought breaker. God raises up a rainmaker named Elijah, the prophet Elijah. And he calls rain to fall. And he caused the drought to be gone and he brought the nation back to God. And let me, just, let me just stop here and interject this. I still believe in 2024 that God raises up drought breakers. Leonard Ravenhill said that while people are praying for the God of Elijah, God is looking for the Elijahs of God. God is looking for people who will bring the rain in their workplace. He's looking for people who will break the drought in their schools. He's looking for people who will take territory at the ball field or on your team or in the bleachers. God is looking for rain makers. Throughout the Bible, rain is a type of God's spirit. Type of God's spirit. Water is, is, is a type. It's symbolized in scripture. It symbolized life. It symbolized freedom. It symbolized cleansing. It symbolized salvation. Jesus said in John chapter 7, 38, Whoever believes on me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Like if you believe there will be so much in you, there will be so much living water, water in you that will it will literally overflow Matthew 5 and verse 6 that Jesus said blessed are those who hunger and watch this thirst for righteousness for they will be filled filled with the with the with the river of righteousness John 4 and 14 but those who drink the water I give Jesus said, we'll never be thirsty again. In fact, it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So while rain was symbolic of life in Scripture, often drought was symb symbolic of the judgment of God. If you saw drought in the Scriptures, it generally, uh, it generally pointed to a people that needed a miracle from God. People that needed a move of God. They needed His Spirit. They needed His Word. They needed His plan for their life. And listen, if you find yourself 
in this position today, God has come to fill you to overflowing. And I want to give you three simple little ways from this passage, from this passage, that, that you can break any drought that you have or that you've come dealing with in your spirit. And the first is out of verse 41, when Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. The first thing you got to do, number one, is listen up. Listen up. I, I don't mean when you're in the minivan and you tell all the kids in the back, listen up. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about listening up. Rather than listening here or listening down, I got to listen up. There's so many voices here that are not leading me down the right path. This voice right here never will lead you down the right path. And it's amazing how often we give ear to the enemy. But if we're going to step into all that God has for us, all that God has for you, you must hear from God. We have to learn to listen up. There are, there are no superstars in the kingdom of God. And Elijah was not a superstar. As a matter of fact, James 5 and verse 17, James, the brother of Jesus, said that Elijah was just a man like you and I. Like Elijah's no different than you and I. But then he went on to say, but he prayed. He listened to God. Listen to me. What's going to separate you from others as you navigate this culture, this world, come on, 20, <coughs> 2024, election year. <laughs> As we navigate life in another election year, what's going to separate you from others is your ability to listen to God, to hear from Him, and then obey what He's calling you to do. It has nothing to do with your family background. It has nothing to do with your social status has nothing to do with how much money you have or what your race or gender is or who your daddy is. It has everything to do with your ability to listen to God, to hear the word of God and obey that word. My, my, my son and I were traveling together uh, about a year ago. We were in, a, in an airport. Or we were in San Antonio trying to get out of town. And it was it's February, so there were delays. And um, even though, you know, we don't get a whole lot of ice and snow in San Antonio, Texas. Like if it's drizzling in Seattle, somehow it delays flights in San Antonio. It's just amazing how it all works. But we're, we were delayed and the, the, you know, the concourse was, was packed and the terminal was packed. I should say there was nowhere to sit. So we were way over, uh, away from the gate, trying to listen to gate announcements. And, and sure enough, they come on the mic and like, okay, well, let's listen to what they're going to say. And that's, that's, all, that's all I could hear. Can you hear? I can't hear what they're saying. We had, we had people all around us. We had this one girl who was, who was on the phone, you know, sitting there like she's the only person in the airport, you know. Like there was nobody else in the airport. I know, girl, you tell it. And I'm just like, do you think, do you think you're the only person in the terminal? So what did we have to do? I had to actually stand up and change locations so that I could hear the information that I needed to hear so that I didn't miss the moment that God had for me, that I, that, that I, that I had for myself. There are certain seasons in our life when we've got to just remove some people, some things, some habits from our life that have become distractions that are causing you to not hear what God is saying. What is it in your life that's causing you to miss the voice of God? I believe that God is speaking all of the time. We just miss it because we're so tuned into so many things. We're listening to this too much. We're connected to a 24-hour news cycle too much. We've surrounded ourselves with voices that are not godly voices. And so we're hearing the haters and the naysayers and the provocators. And, and what we need to be doing is doing whatever we have to do to make sure that we are listening up. Listen up. I've got to listen up so that I can know what God is saying. Like before I buy a house, I want to listen up. But b before, uh, before I take a new job, listen up. Before you get married, listen up. Right? In fact, you need to start listening up long before that. You need to start listening up before you even go on that date. Right? Right? But before you even ask her or ask him on that date. 
Listen up. I know it's, I know it's not a relationship series, but, but it is February. So I, I do want to throw this, throw this little nugget in here. Um, too many people are, are, are dating desperately in, in 2024. They're not listening up. They're dating desperately. You know what dating desperate is like? It's like going to the grocery store during fast week. Everything looks good. You know what I'm saying? You're just so hungry. I want some of that. I'll take two of those. Yes, get, get that. Yes, we're taking it all home. And you wind up in a situation where you don't want to be in when you date desperately. Don't do that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things will be added unto you. Listen up. God, what do you say? God, who do you have for me? I got I to listen up. I, Elijah said, I, I hear the sound. I hear the sound. There was, there was no natural indication that informed Elijah that it was about to rain. He didn't, he didn't see it. He couldn't smell it. He certainly couldn't feel it yet. But he said, I, 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 I hear it. Elijah was listening up. And he heard from God. You know, there's something that's unique about us believers we who follow Christ, we are, we are a little bit different. In fact, the Bible calls us a peculiar people. And some are more peculiar than others, to be sure, right? But, but, but we're all a peculiar people. We don't simply live by our five senses. We actually have a sixth sense called faith. And, and, and we, we hear from God we hear from God, and it, and it creates this, this crazy faith in our life. A lot of times we are not moved, and we should not be moved necessarily by what we see, but moved rather by what God says. And sometimes even if there's no cloud in the sky, it's amazing. We can still hear rain. Watch, this, watch what Paul said in Romans chapter 10. He said, so then faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. So faith does not begin with seeing. Faith begins with hearing. And if, you, if, you, if you're one of those that say, I need to see it to believe it, okay. But that's not how faith works. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. That's the beauty of, of what's happening in this room today. You've come to church today and ever since you walked in the doors... The band has been singing the word of God. You've been hearing the word of God. And even though you don't really even realize it, it might not even be tangible. It's activating some faith in your life. Now I'm preaching the word of God. You're hearing the word of God. And when I hear the word of God, it's amazing how it creates this, this crazy faith in me. It activates something in me. And from, from faith, I actually am able to produce fruit. So some people are wondering why... Why can I, I can't seem to get any fruit in my life? And they're not attending church regularly. They're, they're not opening their Bible and reading the Word of God. Without Word, there's no faith. And without faith, there is no fruit. Faith comes by hearing. That's where it starts. It starts with hearing. This is why your pastor tells you don't just come to, don't just get in the book on Sundays when you're in the building, but man, Open that Bible and read it every single day of the week. Go biblical before you go digital. Before you try to look at about all the negative things that happened overnight while you were sleeping, open the Bible and see what God has to say about your life. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. I love how Elijah bowed low and he put his head between his knees, the Scripture said. And he prayed, put his head between his knees so as to block out all of the distractions. i got to listen up. Second thing I want to point out is verse 42. Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. If you're going to break the drought in your life, you need to listen up. You need to hear from God. But then, you got to climb up. you got to climb up. You need to do your part. Elijah sat. I'm sorry, Abraham. We're not preaching about Abraham today. It is the third service. Ahab sat. Elijah climbed. Ahab could be found eating. Elijah could be found climbing. 
Where, where you're going to be in the next 12 months is up to you. It's going to be determined, listen to me, by the mountains you are willing to climb. And this idea of, well, I'm just going to kind of sit here and eat and let God do his thing. That's not how God works. Like we sit around waiting on a move of God and God's waiting on a move of man. And, and, and when you do what you can do, God will always step in and do what you cannot do. God is not going to do what you can do for you, but he will do what you cannot do. We just have to make a, make a move. What God has for you is going to require movement from you. We went to a, my boys and I went to a Spurs game, a San Antonio Spurs game. Maybe you've heard of them. I don't know. Uh, NBA team with just five championships. Um, and they've been really bad, though, for the last six or seven years. But this was before they were really bad, while they were still really good. And, and me and the boys went to a game. And, and, you know, during the break in the quarters, between the quarters, they always play these games out on the court, if you've ever been to any of these games. And they do things to kind of keep the crowd engaged. And they have people sponsor the games. And so this particular game was sponsored by Whataburger, which is a you know, fast food joint uh, that's based there in San Antonio, Texas. And they set up these big trash cans, and they brought two contestants out on the court. They gave them foam french fries. And the person that could throw the most big foam french fries into the trash can during the allotted time won. The announcer said, free Whataburger for a year. And, and, and when he said that, my boys were like, oh, free Whataburger for a year. And, and I had the opposite reaction. I threw up in my mouth just a little bit. But it's just, okay, it's decent fast. If it's fast food, if it's fast food you want it, it's pretty good. But, but, but the guy that won during the allotted time, they didn't like bring a semi over to his house full of burgers and fries and shakes and back it up into his driveway. Beep, beep, beep. And, and have him open the garage door and unload 365 days worth of food. That's not how it worked. They gave him a card that had a promise on it that if he would show up, he would receive what he had been promised. He had to actually get his promise and he had to get in his car and drive, walk up to the counter, and that's how he got free Whataburger for a year. We have to participate in order to access the promises of God. God has given us so many promises in this book. When the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're the head, not the tail, above, not beneath. All of these promises from God, we have access to them, but we have to participate. We have to participate as Jesus would heal people throughout the New Testament over and over and over again. He would tell them to go do something. And, and once they went and did it, they would be healed. He told lepers one day, go show yourself to the priest. They're like, well, we've already done that. We are unclean. We can't do that. But they had faith. He said, go. And the Bible said, as they went, they were healed. So many of the promises that God has for our life require us to go. What is that as, that as they went for you? What have you been missing out on that God has for you because you've been unwilling to climb? What climb is God calling you to make? Maybe you're experiencing a drought of fulfillment and contentment. And God's like, listen, you, you can actually serve on a dream team and start, start giving yourself to something bigger than yourself. It's amazing. It's amazing how God works. How, how, how when I give, I'm refreshed more than those I'm giving to. When I serve, the scripture says, he that refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So if you're looking for refreshment in your spirit, it might be that you need to just refresh someone else. It might need, to be, need be that you need to serve. You need to stand at a door. You need to teach uh, the, the, kid, the kids' ministry or the student ministry here at Freedom Church. What climb do you need to make? Do you need to forgive someone today? You, you, you're bound you're struggling with freedom and you're in freedom church and you feel like you don't have freedom and it's all because you're hanging on to something someone did to you and you're, un, you're unwilling to let it go and you think 
by holding on to this thing, I'm holding them captive. But it's actually just the opposite. By holding on to this thing, you're holding yourself captive. And God is saying, there's nothing I can do. I can't take you into your purpose, into your fulfillment, until you're willing to let go of that thing. And letting go and forgiving is not about minimizing the offense that, that someone did. It's simply about putting it in God's hand and setting yourself free to step into the purpose that God has for you. What climb do you need to make today? You need to attend growth track. You need to join a small group. You need to start giving. You need to start tithing. What climb do you need to make today? Maybe it's, maybe it's just stepping, stepping it up a little bit as it relates to your worship, as it relates to your, your praise. I, had, I preached recently about praise and worship in, in, in my church, and someone, someone asked me a while back, hey, why, do, why is it that you preach so much about worship? Like, well, you know, I'm a believer and I've been, I've been set free. I've been set free from a lot of things. And, and, and first of all, God is, God is pleased with my sacrifice of praise. But let me just also say that silence is not the sound of victory. Silence is not. So if you're in the room today going, why are they clapping? Why are they shouting? Why are they singing so loud? Why are they playing music so loud? Well, it's all Bible. And silence is not the sound of victory. When the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. If you've been set free, the scripture tells us to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Voice of triumph. Man, if you're in my house, I know there's probably some eagles. I know there's Ravens fans in the house. And Ravens fans, I get it, I get it. But, you know, my team's in the division with the Eagles, and someone came up, of course, after church and had to say something about the Eagles in the last game. Kind of messed my spirit up. Had to go pray back through. <laughs> not really. Not really. I have some amazing Eagles fans in, in my church in, in, in Texas. But, but if you're in my house while the Cowboys are playing, and I do recall the last time we played the Eagles, man, and we just kind of really, really, really beat them really, really bad. I think that was in December. And... Um, there was so much noise made in the house. Lots of yelling. We are rabid Cowboys fans. High five and jumping around yelling. The dog loves to get involved. She'll grab a toy and throw it across the room. <laughs> Why are we making noise? We're victorious. Silence is not the sound of victory. If God's brought you through some things, you ought to praise Him. If God has done some things for you, you ought to praise Him. You ought to lift your voice. You ought to shout unto Him. And maybe that's an area in your life that you need to step up. The scripture says that God's address is your praise. He inhabits the praises of his people. I'm just not feeling God. I want to feel God. Why do, are you praising him? Are you worshiping him? Are you sacrificially praising him? Maybe that's an area that you need to climb. You need to climb. So we've got to listen. Our faith is activated. We've got to climb. I've got to do my part. And then... Then next, verse 43, then Elijah, then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. Go and look. If you're going to break the drought in your life, you need to look up. You need to be looking up. God said it. I heard it. I'm doing my part. I'm doing everything that I know to do. Now, I'm going to look for the miracle. I'm going to look up for the miracle. Elijah told the servant seven different times, go, go, go and look. It's going to rain. I heard it. I heard it. I know it's going to rain, so, so go look. And the servant goes and looks. See, I, I don't see anything. It's like it's just completely blue sky. And, and, he, and he comes back. And there's nothing there. Well, go look again. Got it. He went and looked again. There's, there's still nothing, absolutely nothing there. And he goes back. And Elijah says, go, go look again. And about this time, he's like, okay. Okay, I see, what we're, I see what we're doing here. I see what we're doing. And he goes and looks. And this time he stays a little bit longer, you know, because he didn't want Elijah to think he's not really looking. So he knows there's nothing there, but he, he stays longer. And he comes back, uh, prophet, there's still nothing, nothing there. And, and to his amazement, Elijah's like, well, we'll go, go, look, go look again. And, and so he's, well, at least I'm getting my steps in now because I, I don't. And he, and he goes and looks five times, six times, over and over and over. And sees, sees nothing. I love this. Come on, it's a picture of what every single one of us need to be doing as it relates to promises that God has given you. Miracles, 
something with you, something with your family, something with your child. Maybe there's people in here, you've been praying and believing for a child. Keep looking. Maybe you're believing that your child will come back to faith. Keep looking. Don't, don't, don't stop looking. Maybe you're believing for a physical miracle in, in your life. Don't stop looking. Here's, here's why. Hebrews 11 and 1 says that faith is confidence. Everybody say confidence. Confidence in what we hope for. It's assurance about what we do not see. It's not about what I see. It's about what he says. It's not about what I see. It's about what this word says concerning my life and my future. It's confidence. You know what faith looks like? Faith looks like looking. I'm looking. I've got confidence. You know what hope is? We, we think of hope as Wishful thinking. In, in modern culture, hope is wishful thinking. You know, I, I hope the Ravens can get to the Super Bowl next year, right? I hope, and I'm with you guys. I was cheering for you guys in that championship game. Uh, I hope that one day Lamar can beat Patrick, you know. I hope. We, we, we hope. It's wishful thinking. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. But that's biblical hope is not wishful thinking. The Hebrew word translated as hope in the Old Testament and the Greek word translated as hope in the New Testament both mean waiting. It's not wishful thinking. It's just waiting on what I know is going to happen. And so until it happens, I'm going to keep looking. Through disappointment, I'm going to keep looking. I didn't know it was going to turn out this way, but I'm not going to stop looking. I can't believe this has happened, but I'm not going to stop looking. Abraham, Romans 4, hoped against hope. In a hopeless situation, God had promised him, your descendants, sand of the sea, stars in the sky. And even after a hundred years, he kept hope and he hung on to what God's word was. The book of Zechariah in the Old Testament says that we can become a prisoner of hope. I love that picture. I don't want to be a prisoner of bitterness. I don't want to be a prisoner of fear. I want to be a prisoner of hope. I want to be bound by my belief. I know what God said. I know what His Word has promised. I know that I'm doing everything that I can. So I'm looking. I'm hoping. I'm just waiting for that miracle to become a reality. And sure enough, that servant went and looked a seventh time. And to his amazement, it wasn't much. But he sees tiny little cloud tiny little cloud about the size of a man's hand and he goes back to Elijah and says hey hey well, I got some good news and some bad news I actually saw a cloud but the bad news is that, that mighty rainstorm you heard this ain't it this ain't it it's not it so, so you might want to like go back to praying and keep, keep seeking God or whatever <clears throat> but I love how Eli Elijah teaches us a lesson here he immediately, upon hearing that there's a cloud the size of a man's hand, says, you better go tell Ahab to get off the mountain because it's about to rain. He didn't go up and start begging God anymore. He moved on the small thing. It's taken me some years to learn this. But in some 30 years of ministry, I finally learned that sometimes small clouds bring big rain and we've got to learn to celebrate the small to celebrate the seed to move on the seed I want my child to change but I want to celebrate the fact that they sent me a text last week asking me where they could buy a Bible I, I want my body to be completely healed but I want to celebrate that I got a scan back last week and it was a positive scan I want to celebrate that I want to move on the small and so the heavens opened up and the drought was broken. What drought needs to be broken in your life today? Even as I've preached today, what has the Word activated in your spirit? What, what is God calling you to do? What step is God calling you to make? Maybe it's just to acknowledge the drought. Like that may be all you need to do today. Acknowledge. Yeah, I got dryness deep and allow the windows of heaven to open up and feel you to overflowing. Jesus made 
a loud statement in John chapter 7, verse 37. It says, on the last day, the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, this is not quiet, peaceful, don't want to bother anybody, Jesus. This is Jesus who knew he had what everybody needed. He looked past, this was a festival, so everybody's dressed up, got the best on. He looked past the spray hair, the neckties, the nice suits, the nice shiny shoes. He looked past all that and he saw the dehydrated hearts. And he said with a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And I feel like that is just the message for the 11 o'clock service. Today. As we close our final service for today, he's calling every one of you to the well. If you're thirsty, it's here. It's here. Would you stand with me all over the building? Would you stand with me all over the building? I want to pray for you. first for those in the room who are who are not in a relationship with Jesus. Like, and you know it. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Or maybe there was a season in your life where you were close to Him. But you know you're not anymore. I want to give you a chance. Man, this is a chance of a lifetime. Wow. May we never lose the wonder of the fact that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants to connect Revelation chapter 4 says he stands at the door and knocks. Wow. If anybody should be knocking on anybody's door, I should be knocking on his door. And yet he's here knocking on your heart's door. And all you have to do is open up and let him in. And if you do, he brings joy, contentment, freedom, salvation. He brings life. So with heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking around, if you don't mind. Hey, I want you to know that Jesus loves you just like you are. He accepts you just like you are. No matter how messed up you feel. But He loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants to bring you salvation, freedom, purpose. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, if you'd say, Jonathan, I, I, need, I need a fresh start today. I need to be included in this prayer of surrender. I, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Will you throw a hand in the air right now? Come on, all over the building, hands in the air. If you need to be included in this prayer, that's awesome. Leave them up if you don't mind. Come on, every location, hands in the air. That's beautiful, guys. I see them, I see them, I see them. That's awesome. All right, you can put your hands down now. Hey, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer of surrender. I invite everybody to pray this prayer along with me. You can use your words or mine. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you this amazing February weekend, 2024, I'm starting over and following you. I'm surrendering everything to you, Jesus. I'm making you the Lord of my life. I repent today, Jesus. Forgive me for my sins. Lord, I believe in you. I believe you gave your life for me and that you rose from the grave. And today I'm making a fresh start with you. In Jesus' name. Come on, and everybody said amen. Big hand for all of those who just took that step of faith, y'all.